I will 
Phil's going to bring us a special. Have y'all missed Phil? Loves to stir the pot. 
You know what I'm saying? He is the one that he puts it out there and I'm like, Mike, why did you post that, right? You know, but it's like, I know that's why he did it, right? And, and he, I can just see now he can just sit back and laugh about it as soon as he posts it. That's the kind of guy that he is. But I'm going to tell you this. Uh, uh, just a few days ago, uh, just the other day, this was his post. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that this word for word, this is what he said. This is my post. Let the fighting begin. <laughs> that's all he said. This is my post. Let the fighting begin. And sure enough, after about five comments underneath, the fighting began. And I was like, man, that's all he said. He said nothing about other than this is my post. Let the fighting begin. And there it was. And it just goes to show you, it doesn't matter what you do, someone's probably going to have a problem with it. Someone's got a problem with it. Trust me, I know. <laughs> As the old saying goes, you're never going to make everyone happy. It's not going to happen, especially if you're in some form of leadership position. People will always have a problem with what you're doing. You know, you look back at the leaders in Scripture, and they always dealt with problems within the people. Poor Moses. I mean, think about Moses, right? Moses, poor Moses, had the Israelites griping at him all the time. Can you imagine two million people coming to you all the time with a problem? Man, I, I just can't imagine it. But here's the answer to it. The answer is this. Always do what you know is right. Always do what you know is right. As believers, listen to me, friends, we are always to do what we believe the Lord has told us to do. There's no question. We should be obedient to it. Well, in our passage of Scripture tonight, we actually see the end of the saga with the situation with Peter and Cornelius that we have looked at in the past three weeks, and now this is week four, that we really, I, I told you last week we were going to end it last week, but really this is connecting to it, because Peter is going to have to answer for going to the Gentiles, but Peter is going to defend what he knew was right. Okay? So out of honor and reverence to the reading of God's word, if physically able, please stand with me. Acts chapter 11. We're going down to verse 18 tonight. <clears throat> now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheep, led down from heaven by four corners when it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed four animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remember the word of the Lord, how he had said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. God, I continue to say thank you for, once again, the, the word behind this morning, for that you have provided everything that we need. You are the necessary sacrifice. God, you've done above and beyond. Lord, thank you so much. And Father, I know that even when we do what's right, God, the world is going to come against us. There are going to be those that are, that are going to hate you. They're going to hate us because, once again, they hate you. And so, Lord, I, I pray right now that we will just do what we know you have laid on our hearts to do, and that we continue to take the gospel to a, a lost and dying world that needs it, Lord. Father, this world is dark, and it needs the light. And so, Father, I pray that even though there will be those that will not like what we're doing, Father, that we will continue to do what we know is right. And we 
what you've laid on our hearts. So, Father, I pray right now for the encouragement of the saints tonight. Lord, I pray that if there is someone here that needs to accept you as Lord and Savior, that you draw them in. Lord, you use your word to do that tonight. But, Father, I pray as I look out across this audience tonight, Lord, uh, Lord, I, I don't know hearts, but you do. But, Father, I, I look out across here tonight, and I, I see a group of people that, that want to be used by you. They're, they're saved. They want to stir in, in the lives of people around them. And so, Father, I pray right now that you embolden us, empower us, Lord, to always do what's right. Father, we love you, and we ask for right now that you just bless this time you've given us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As I said earlier, we have just spent the last three weeks looking at the story of Peter and Cornelius. And man, what a story. I encourage you to go back from time to time and look at that and, and let that be a wake-up call. Once again, as far as Cornelius, I remind you, he was a man, a devout man, gave alms to the poor. He did all that he could, but he was without Jesus. <laughs> and, and that's something that we need to recognize. Once again, it's not based on works. It's based on a relationship, right? So we hammered that point throughout those weeks. And, and what a powerful story, if you think about it, that really changed the course of of history. We saw the gospel being officially brought to the Gentiles. And tonight, Peter is having an answer for it. He is going to have to answer for it. So let's go ahead and jump into our first point. Because I want you to notice Peter's confrontation. I want you to notice, number one, Peter's confrontation. Look again at verse 1 through 3. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying... You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, here's something that we, we would actually think about, we should think about. At the end of verse 1, it says, The apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. You would think that would have been a celebration moment, right? You, you would think, praise God, man. The, the word of God is spreading. The message of God is spreading. Man, it's a praise God moment. But uh, <laughs> no, it is not. Peter has just done the unthinkable. He, he really has. And plus, I want to remind you that Peter himself, even at first, did not want to associate himself with anything unclean. And when the Lord told him to eat, you remember what Peter told him? We saw it a few weeks ago, and actually Peter reminded himself and reminded everyone else what he said right here. Look, look at actually what he said in verse 8. But I said, not so, Lord. Remember, it's like Peter said, I ain't going to do it. Uh-uh. No way, as a little child trying to feed him food. Mm -mm. No, right? That's what was happening. And, but you see, for the Jews, listen to me, friend, the Gentiles were considered unclean. They were unclean. And in their eyes, no more serious charge could be brought against a fellow Jew. Now, the group that we see right here appears to be a group of believing Jews who made up the Jerusalem Fellowship. Now, here's what's interesting. How they heard, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But we do know that the distance between from where he was and where he went, we know the Bible says about 30 miles, right? It was about 30 miles. So we know, friends, that news travels fast, doesn't it? News travels fast. Plus, we don't really know how long Peter stayed there in Caesarea. We don't know. The only thing we know is that at the end of chapter 10, in verse 48, it says this. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. So it could have been two days, three days, could have been a week. However long it was, it was long enough that news traveled back and got back to Jerusalem before Peter got back to Jerusalem. Okay? The news about what he had done had gotten back. And all we know is it arrived there and it had sufficient time to be digested. And it also had enough time to turn sour in the belly of some of the Jews. <laughs> they were upset about it. I mean, Peter here had broken a religious taboo. He had ceremonially defined himself, defiled himself, and he deserved to be excommunicated. That's what they were getting at right here. No doubt, if you think about it, the other disciples were probably embarrassed by Peter. Peter, how could you do that? Peter, you, you know better, right? How, how could you do this? Now, listen to me, friends. They had no clue as far as what the Lord had told Peter. They had no clue as far as the circumstance. They did not know any of these things. But let me ask you this, friends. Doesn't this really show human nature? What do you mean, Brother Colin? Well, let me ask you. What I mean by that is, don't we tend to think the negative without hearing the positive? And before you're like, no, yeah, you do. 
Yes, we do. We tend to believe the negative before we ever even hear the positive. Most people tend to hear the negative, and, and then when they hear the negative, what do they do? They run with it. They run with it. Now, do they run with it? They add to it, right? That's what tends to happen from time to time. Let me ask you this. Have you ever, have you ever heard, or let me ask you, have you ever used the phrase, can you believe so-and-so? Can you believe that? Can you believe that they would do such a thing? Can you believe that? Well, listen, friends, there's no doubt. That was the situation right here with Peter. That's what he was facing. It had gone all over town that Peter had gone into the uncircumcised. Matter of fact, you, you can hear it now. Can you believe what Peter did? This is supposed to be just for us. And Peter took it to those low-down, stinking Gentiles. What was he thinking? Folks, if you have learned anything on this earth, it's this. People talk. Am I right? People talk. They do. They'll run you down without hearing anything, and they'll pass it along. And then you, it ends what happening is you end up playing the telephone game. Y'all remember the telephone game? You whisper in one person's ear, and you say, now pass it along to the next one. And then they pass it along, then you know what? They tend to forget a little bit. Well, I think they said this, and that story gets stretched, and then before the end of the ten phone calls is all said and done, it's a whole new story that had nothing to do with anything. That's what happens. People talk. And because people talk, people will confront us no matter what we do for the Lord. Why? Because the devil hates it. There's your answer. It's because the devil hates it. Especially, let me just say this, especially if it's something that's never been done before. Especially if it's something that makes the people feel uncomfortable. And listen to me, I'm talking about to the church tonight. The seven deadliest words in a church, you've heard me say it before, I'm going to say it again. It's never been done that way before. We've never done it that way before. That'll kill a church. That mindset will kill a church. Why? Because you get caught in that rut. You get used to doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. And when the Lord comes in and tells you to do something, just like the Lord told Peter to do something, well, I can't believe that. That's craziness. I, no, 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 that's just crazy talk. You know, we can't do that. Just, mm, I just don't feel right. It's not based on your feelings, friends. It's based on a relationship. We have to do what the Lord tells us to do, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable. I'm not getting a lot of amens tonight. I didn't expect to. But it's the truth. So we must be ready for confrontation when doing the Lord's will, friends. Because guess what? Even those within the church. Here were the disciples. This is the early church. Getting mad at Peter for doing what God told Peter to do. That's why we always just have to do what's right. That's why we have to do it. But after his confrontation... Then secondly, we see Peter's commentary. We see Peter's commentary. Now, I'm not going to read all this together right now, so I'm going to break it down into parts here in just a moment. But we see it in verses 4 through 15. Just like anyone would do, what does Peter do? Peter defends himself, and he gives a commentary on what happened. Now, Peter breaks this down. As I told you, I'm going to break this, this passage down into three different parts. And that's what Peter really does. You see, Peter lets them know, first of all, that he himself... Number one, had a vision from God. He said, listen to me. Y'all, I had a vision from God. God himself told me this. Look at verse 4 through 10. But Peter explained to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheep, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven. When God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. With this, with Peter telling them this about this vision, the critics were silenced. They were silenced. Wait, wait a minute, so, so he's had a vision from God. I mean, really, friends, if you think about it, with his very first statement, 
You learn something about Peter. How can you say that, Brother Calvin? Well, notice this. What do you learn about Peter? He was a praying man. Look at his very first statement right there in verse 4. Peter explained to them in order from the beginning saying, I was in the city of Joppa. What was he doing? Praying. I was in the city of Joppa praying. It's hard to argue with someone when someone says, hey, I've truly prayed about this. God has laid this on my heart. Y'all, I can't tell you how many times people will come to me and say, Brother Kyle, you know, I've been in prayer about this and I feel like God's calling me to do this. You know, my answer always is, then you better do it. If you've prayed about it, prayer is what? Communication with God, right? And if God has laid on your heart to do this, and you know you, you get a, you've got the clear answer from God to do it, listen, friend, you better be obedient. But so many times, here's what we do. Well, I, I, God, you want me to do that? I better pray about that some more. I've told you before, what is prayer? Prayer is communication with God. You just communicated with God. God just told you what to do, so it's time to just be obedient. And that's what we see right here. Peter lets him know, hey, I, was, I was in communication with God. I was in the city of Joppa. I was praying. And God laid this on my heart by vision. Listen, he didn't do this on his own. He wasn't, while he was in the state of praying, saying, you know what? I feel like I need to do this. No, no, no. Hey, this wasn't on his own. No, no. He'd been praying. God gave him this. Now, what probably struck them was the fact that that vision was contrary to the Levitical law. <laughs> They're probably like, hmm. Let's think about this. And once again, remember I told you a few weeks ago that even Peter had a problem with this. It seemed to contradict what the Lord had previously put in place. And church, I want to remind you that God never contradicts his word, okay? Never contradicts his word. It's just that now, listen to me, friends, God had a new purpose. God had a new purpose. Before, God was building his people. Now, God is building his church with the added group of people. That's what he's doing now. But Peter let them know that three different times God brought this vision to him. But friends, listen to me. Not only did he let them know about the vision from God, but secondly, he also let them know about the visit for God. He let them know about the vision or about the visit for God. Look at verse 11. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. Peter let them know that immediately after the vision, there were three men standing at his door. They were there from Caesarea, and the Lord told him to go with them. What does it say? Doubting nothing. God told me not to doubt it. I mean, here I already said, I, I'm not going to eat this. No, 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 Lord, I can't. And he says, I'm bringing it down again. Three different times he brings that. By the way, it's not a coincidence that three different times the sheep came down that were, was filled with unclean animals, and there was three different unclean men that were standing at his door. But that's it again. So we see that for each individual, God said, that man is clean, that man is clean, that man is clean. Think about that. <laughs> God proved right there that that was the case. But listen to me, friends. It is a good thing to know that you're in the will of God whenever you would normally want to make a decision that is this huge on your own. What I'm trying to say is this. It is always a smart move when contemplating some course of action to be sure that we have the mind of God about it. That we are in accordance with His will. And listen to me, friends. This is true in dealing with all of life's decisions. No matter how large, no matter how small, the thought should always be, did I pray about it? Did I pray about it? God, is this what you want for me? Is this what you want for our family? Church, let the Holy Spirit dictate it for you. Right? Let him make that decision. And friends, where the Holy Spirit leads, that's where we always need to go. So he made this visit for God. It was a visit for God. Then Peter let them know that not only was there a vision from God and a visit for God, but in his commentary right here, he also let them know that there was a victory through God. There was a victory through God. Look at verse 15 and 16. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John indeed baptized with water, 
but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Think about this for a moment, friends. Really, really think about this. <laughs> Peter knew that what had happened in that Gentile home was the same thing that had happened to him and the other disciples in the upper room. The exact same thing happened. It was victory right here. Now the Gentiles had been added to the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit. The whole, Peter didn't add them to the body. Listen to me, church. The Holy Spirit added them to the body. The Holy Spirit brought them in. Can you imagine the face of the Jewish believers, faces of them, when Peter told them this? In other words, listen to me. It's kind of hard to debate the truth in the work of the Lord. It's kind of hard to debate that. Peter said, I saw it. The Holy Spirit fell down upon that place. And listen to me, friends. When the Holy Spirit comes in the room, you know it. You know it. Peter knew it. Why? Because he had experienced it himself. Which then leads us to finally notice Peter's own confirmation. Peter's confirmation. Look at verse 17 and 18. If therefore... God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. By asking the question that Peter does right here in verse 17, you know what Peter does? He puts the ball in their court. Peter puts the ball in their court. I mean, look at that question again. He says, if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is I that I could withstand God? Think about that question. He has just now confirmed the Gentiles. Why? Because God confirmed the Gentiles with the Holy Spirit. And he had no intention of standing in the way with God. And so he asked them, what about you? I'm not going to stand in the way of what God wants us to do. I'm not going to say, no, God, I'm going to be obedient. When he says to go, I'm going to go. And who am I to stand in the way of the works of God? That's where Peter moved his piece and said, checkmate. Checkmate. And then going on, the Bible then says <laughs> that they looked at one another. Can you imagine their reaction? Let me ask you this. Have you ever confronted somebody and then realized you were in the wrong? And you had to eat a little bit of what's called humble pie? I'm sure their heads hung for a moment. And they said, Peter, you're right. Peter, you're right. And notice this. It's almost like this doesn't belong in the same sentence. Notice what it says in verse 18. When they heard these things, they became silent. And they notice this. And they glorified God. It's like, it's, it's like that's a conundrum there, isn't it? It's like they became silent. Oh, man, you know, hey, guys. <laughs> hey, guys, you know, you know what Peter, Peter's right. So praise God. Praise God. And, and they turned things around. They, they must look at one another and realize that that was a hard pill to swallow, and they agreed with him. You know, listen to me, friends. I, always, I also want to bring out this point. Sometimes, all it takes is for one person to do the right thing and maybe even face that battle on their own. And when God sees them through, their boldness will lead other people to do the right thing. Sometimes, friends, it may be you at work having to stand all alone for the gospel when everyone else is making fun of you and pointing at you and, and, and calling you a religious fanatic and all these things else. But listen, when trying times come, guess who they're going to come to to ask you to pray for them? They recognize you. They, they realize who you are. They realize your stance. And when they realize these different things, they recognize that, you know what? Maybe he or she is right. And by your boldness, you're going to give an example of boldness to others. You know what? They stood, so can I. So can I. So be that example. And church, lead others to do the right thing. Church, the invitation is not simple. 
You know, once again, as I said in my prayer, I'm looking out across the place just from my perspective. I know you. I look at you. I see saved believers that are out here tonight. On a Sunday night Bible study, a gorgeous day when it's so easy to say at home. See faithful believers. But you know what? We're all tempted sometimes not to do the right thing. And you know, maybe there's someone in here tonight you know you need to do what you need to be doing or what you know you should not be doing so that you can take the gospel around you to those that need to be hearing it. Be bold. Church, always do the right thing. And if you need to come right now to this altar, maybe you'd like to come to me and, and let me pray with you over a situation, whatever it may be. Brother Corbin will be here as well. If you'd like to come one of, to one of us and let us pray with you over a situation where you know, hey, it's hard to do the right thing, then come on. But maybe you'd like to just come to this altar tonight. But listen to me. Leave here knowing that it's always right to do the right thing, especially when it comes to promoting for the gospel. Heavenly Father, I love you. And Lord, I know that sometimes it is hard. God, even when we know that you are leading us to do something, Lord, there are those around us that are not going to understand. They're, they're going to get upset. They're going to be uncomfortable. Father, whatever it may be, I just pray that we're faithful to you. But God, in the end, right here we see that, God, you, you receive the glory from it. God, they were silent, and then they glorified it. Lord, I, I pray that our actions will prove our walk with you, that where people around us will see that what we're doing is being obedient to you. And Father, forgive us for the times that we are not obedient to you. Forgive us for the times when we decide to go along with the world and not do the right thing. Father, give us strength, give us boldness to always do the right thing. Because Lord, I know we're, we're going to have our own confrontation, just like Peter. But Father, may, may we have a commentary like Peter. May we be able to back up what we believe by using your word. Father, I just pray right now that we will be the people that you have us to be. And that God, that we know that we've got your confirmation, Lord. But Father, I pray that we'll be example to others. So Lord, I pray for this invitation to come tonight. God, speak to hearts. Draw people to yourself. Give us boldness, Lord, to always do what's right in your eyes. Lord, we love you. Use this time now, I pray in Jesus' name.